All right. During the next few days or possibly more than a week, we're going to discuss America's debt money system in the light of the Bible and God's law and God's prophets. So in the um, next few minutes remaining on this broadcast, turn with me in your Bibles over to James, because James in the New Testament prophesies literally of a day at the end of the age when something would happen. And this has a great bearing on our time, and these events are now coming to pass. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as if it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. And I believe this is an indication that James was actually writing about what is called the last days. And then he says, Of these rich men, behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And he, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Now God's law, which we'll get into in the next few days, states specifically that the laborer is to be paid immediately upon doing his work. I wonder if James knew that sometime in the end of the age that every worker in this great Christian nation would have between 20 and 30 percent of his legitimate wages withheld from him, taken from his paycheck before he actually gets it. Yes, I know they call it income tax, and I know they call it Social Security, but the truth of the matter is, the wages of the laborers is kept back by fraud, and it's kept back from them, and here he says, the cries of these people will enter into the ears of the Lord. He speaks again to the rich men, Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Hundreds of thousands of the finest young men in Christendom have been sacrificed in World War I, World War II, many wars in between, the Korean War and now the Vietnam War for no purpose other than to make these rich men richer as they tax the people for the so-called war and sell the merchandise for the war. Yes, it should be obvious to some of you Christian people that the Vietnam War has accomplished only one thing. The rich have gotten richer, and the poor have gotten poorer. The great banks of the United States have increased their assets by tens of billions of dollars in the last ten years by loans to the United States government and to the men building the machinery for war. James actually said, Yes, you've killed the just, and he doth not resist you. And then he goes on and speaks of the Christians. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. And, brother, sister, I believe the day of the latter rain is literally upon us. And apparently James believed and wrote that when this latter rain came, this would be the time of the miseries that shall come upon the rich men of the earth. Their day is just about over. Their persecution and their oppression of the people of the earth has just about come to an end. Most of you people say, well, you're not persecuted and you're not oppressed. Well, let me ask you, how is it that your grandfather could work with the most primitive or almost the most primitive of tools for ten hours a day for six days a week and could raise a family of eight, nine, ten, and eleven children without the wife and mother being forced to work. And yet today you have the most modern, up-to-date, and scientifically developed equipment and machinery to work with. You produce twenty times as much in every hour of factory work as your grandfather did, and yet you can't raise a family of three children without your wife going to work and hopefully earning almost as much as you do. So the two of you work between 80 and 90 hours a week to support a family of one-third to one-half the size of your grandfather. And you have the benefits of modern civilization to produce things, and yet you live in a smaller house than your grandfather did, and we'll get into that in much more detail during the next few days, Lord willing. You call a friend. Tell them to listen as Pastor Emery talks about the money system and economics. 
in the light of God's holy word. And write, ask for the book coming soon, America Without Debt, Crime, or War, 104 pages. Your copy is free by just writing. The announcer will give the address in a moment. And meanwhile, you pray about this broadcast. Send of your tithes and offerings that we may continue on the air preaching God's word to God's people. Until tomorrow, goodbye, God bless you, and Christian America. If it is possible, I would suggest that you take the time or establish your day or organize your day in such a way that you can take the time to sit down when America's Promise comes on the air and follow through with me in the Holy Bible as we study God's laws, statutes, and judgments on money and also the prophets and also the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to spend the rest of this week and perhaps all of next week in a study of America's debt money system in the light of the Word of God. First turn with me to Romans 15, for Paul said of the Old Testament, of which we will be using quite a bit of during the next few days, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Now Paul said, the old scriptures, the law and the prophets, were written for us, for our learning. And because of that, that we should have patience and comfort of these scriptures, and through them we would have hope. Today there is a great dearth of learning and understanding and teaching of the Old Testament. And that is why the churches have joined with the political leaders of this nation to actually place burdens of debt and pauperize the people because they do not know or understand God's word on economics. Turn in your Bibles back to Nehemiah 5, for we're going to read a history, something that happened to our forefathers, the house of Israel, something that they did under Nehemiah that has a meaning for what we are doing or not doing today. I'm going to start with this, and then as we progress during the next few days, I'm going to show you our present situation in the light of, pri of Bible prophecy, and also that the reason we have gotten in this predicament which we are in is because we have disobeyed God's law, and then the way out is actually given in Nehemiah 5. Now this may be putting the end of the sermon before the beginning, but I want to read you what happened to our Israel people under Nehemiah, what they did because of debts, and then after we study God's word about money and economics and debts, you will have a better understanding of Nehemiah 5 when we finish this Bible study. So we'll start with it first. Nehemiah, you'll recall, had come back with the remnant of the Judah kingdom from 70 years of captivity in Babylon to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, the temple and the wall, and so on. And here they were, trying to build or rebuild this new nation. Chapter 5 of Nehemiah. And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren the Jews. For there were that said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore we take up corn for them, that we may eat and live. In other words, we have to work for these brethren the Jews in order that we may live. Some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses, that we might buy corn because of the dearth. Now this dearth was not a dearth of rain. It was not a drought. It was a lack of money. And these men said, and they complained, We have had to mortgage everything we own in order to get money so we can buy food. Now I'd have you think with me as we read this, and some of you may be confused and not understand what Pastor Emery is getting at, but Lord willing, as we make this Bible study during the next few days, you'll have a better understanding of the exact comparison between the United States of America in the 1900s on through the present day to the situation that prevailed among our kindred back in old Israel under Nehemiah. He said, we've had to mortgage everything we own in order to get money. America has a mortgage, literally, on every piece of property owned by you people and your brethren here in the United States. 
There were also, or there were others, that said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute, and that upon our lands and vineyards. We have had to sell or mortgage our land, our vineyards, our farms, and our homes in order to pay taxes. We can't pay the taxes without going into debt. Yet now, or because of this, yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. They literally own us, and in fact they literally own our children. How many times have you heard politicians, good politicians, warn you people that you are actually selling your children because of the way we have allowed our government to go into debt, that we are providing a situation where our children will have to work for the people who, from whom we have borrowed money. When you uh, uh, give up the reins of this government and pass into the great beyond, you have left behind you a generation or two or three that unless something changes, this will have to go on to eternity, that they will have to work between one-third and one-half and possibly more of every day just to pay debts that you have accumulated. And this is what these people were complaining of. They said, our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren. And the brethren, of course, were referred to in verse 5, their brethren, the Jews. And they said they literally own our children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Already, neither is it in our power to redeem them. We can't pay these debts. We can't buy them back. We have mortgaged everything we own, and they're in bondage, and our children are in bondage, and we're unable to end this thing. For other men have our lands and vineyards. Yes, many of our people have lost their farms, their homes, their factories, their small businesses. They have been foreclosed on by mortgage, and therefore we can't get this necessary money to pay off these debts because everything has been mortgaged and part of it has actually been taken from us. Read the newspapers. Read the financial reports. Get these things in the U.S. News and World Report and read. The banks are foreclosing on multiplied millions of dollars of property every month in this nation. What does that mean? They're taking them for debt. We are actually losing through money and mortgage foreclosure the land that our fathers conquered. Nehemiah recounts this again, and he says in verse 6 of Nehemiah 5, And I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. Then I consulted with myself. And knowing the rest of the history here regarding Nehemiah, it probably means that he sat down and consulted with the Word of God, read it over, tried to find out what they did wrong. He said, I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers. Isn't that something? It was the rulers of the people, the senators, the president, the governors, and the mayors who had put these people in debt to such a situation that they actually had to borrow money to pay their taxes, they had to mortgage everything they owned, and they realized that they had put their children into debt bondage to those of whom they had borrowed money. So Nehemiah, a good godly ruler, rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, Ye exact usury, every one of his brother. What was the thing that was done wrong? He said, You are charging interest on money. And would to God that millions of Christian people across this nation would recognize that the charging of usury on money is a violation of God's law and will bring the judgment of God upon the entire nation, as it had done back there. He didn't turn and rebuke the people for spending too much. He didn't turn and rebuke the people for being lazy or spendthrifts or trying to buy more than they had that they than that they earned, as many of our people do, do today. And they say, "Oh well, the reason we're in debt is people want to buy more than they should." No, brother, sister, we're in debt because we do not have a constitutional, scriptural money system. The only money that goes into circulation in the United States of America 
is money that is borrowed into, into circulation by someone who allows a banker to take mortgage against his property, either against his home or a chattel mortgage against his car or his personal property. We have no other source of money. Every dollar that goes into circulation in this great nation must be borrowed by someone. And when it's borrowed, that means it has to be paid back. And not only must that dollar be paid back, but additional for interest. And, of course, that can't be done until more people borrow more. Do you think we're perhaps in the position that Nehemiah writes and tells us these people were? Yes, they were. And Nehemiah put his finger on the problem. Ye exact usury, ye charge interest on money. And I know that there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of ministers in this nation who never tell the people that the charging of interest is the cause of America's economic troubles. Nehemiah recognized it, and he said, And I set a great assembly against them. Nehemiah turned to the people and said, These men are robbing you because they're violating God's law. They are charging usury, and he set the people against them. And I said unto them, We, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. In other words, we've saved these people from the hands of other people. And will ye even sell your brethren, and shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace, and found nothing to answer. They had no answer for violating God's law on usury. Now today, of course, we haven't arrived at the point where the people have cried under the rulers to the extent that the good godly people will speak up, because in America the preachers who are supposed to preach the word of God to the people never tell them that it's a violation of God's order to charge usury on money. So our people live in a nation where we have mortgaged our lands and our vineyards and our houses in order to have money to buy food. We have set our children in bondage, even unto the generations God only knows how many generations it would take to pay off the debts of America. And the truth is, of course, our debts aren't being paid. All we're paying is billions upon billions upon billions of dollars of interest every year to the moneylenders. And who's responsible? The people responsible are the nobles and the rulers, the rulers in the nation. And who's responsible for them not knowing? Well, it gets back down to the preachers. All right, this is Pastor Sheldon Emery. I wanted to read that far in Nehemiah 5. Tomorrow we'll go into some of the prophecies about this end of the age, and we'll also discuss God's law and other things that God says about money and about the things that would happen when his Israel people turned away from his law, statutes, and judgments. So you listen again tomorrow, have your Bible, follow with me, and some of these, of course, I may not have time to read all of the Scripture verses. If I don't, I'll give them for you, and you can read them after the broadcast. Meanwhile, you write, Ask for my book, Coming Soon, America Without Debt, Crime, or War, because this book is written about the prophecies of the end of the age, about God's laws, statutes, and judgments on money, on economics, on interest, and the other things that pertain to the economic well-being of his people. Coming soon, America without debt, crime, or war. Until tomorrow, goodbye, God bless you, and Christian America. Yesterday we discussed the situation in old Israel after the captivity of Babylon when Nehemiah and Ezra came back to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the situation that pertained to those people in the building of this new nation. Now today I would have you consider with me the situation that this great Christian nation of America finds itself in this end of the age. In this 20th century, in fact actually beginning late in the 19th century, the United States was recognized as easily the wealthiest and most productive nation in the world. We have the manpower, resources, and technical skills today to produce 50% of the manufactured goods of the world. And our agricultural production, of course, is the envy of the world. 
Nowhere in all of this wide God's earth do we find people producing agricultural products in the surpluses that America can produce. And yet the American working people, the farmers and the laborers, who produce this vast store of wealth are always short of money. Most of them are in debt, and the debt has been increasing every year for over 50 years. Our wives are working in unprecedented numbers. Many of the husbands work overtime hours on their job, or at least hope that they can. Many of them, we find, are taking second or part-time jobs, sometimes called moonlighting, for no purpose other than to get enough money to make ends meet for their comparatively small family. And by comparatively small family, I mean a smaller family than their grandfathers had, back when he supposedly had to work so hard for a living. Many families today, when their children reach college age, find that the child or the young man or the young lady must work part-time in order to pay for her own college education because the parents are unable to afford the added burden. At the same time that this is happening, the actual monetary debt of the individuals is climbing higher and higher, and the psychologists and other uh, consultants for family problems tell us that the major cause, yes, the major cause of family breakups and divorce is trouble over money and debt. Yes, would to God some Christian ministers would realize that the major problem of most American families is money and debt and preach a few sermons on money and debt. Our law officers tell us that many of the juvenile delinquents who eventually become hardened criminals come from these broken homes broken up originally over money problems. The Constitution of the United States tells us, in very simple words, Congress shall have the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. And yet, strangely enough, the Congress of the United States has not coined, and that means to create or manufacture money for over 100 years. I wonder how many of my listeners know that the United States government itself, under the authority of Congress, has not issued one single solitary dollar bill for over 100 years. No wonder there's a shortage of money in America. I'd have you consider with me the actual creation of money. We'll get into the uh, legal end of this via the laws, the Constitution, and God's laws, perhaps in another broadcast after today or tomorrow. But I would have you know that the creators of money can print a $1 bill or a $1,000 bill for approximately the same cost. There might be a little more black ink on the $1,000 bill. But money of itself can be created in tremendous amounts for very little cost. A dollar bill would buy about ten cups of coffee. It can be printed or produced for the same amount of money as a ten thousand dollar bill, which would buy a two-room house in one of our smaller cities. So you see that the cost of creating money is very little compared to the actual worth of that money. Now it follows that anyone in the nation who can create money, produce it, print it, or create it out of whatever materials are necessary, can accrue to themselves a tremendous amount of wealth. Now, usually we think of this only in terms of what are called counterfeiters. In other words, a man who uh, surreptitiously and supposedly illegally has a printing press, gets some green ink and some certain kinds of paper, photographically reproduce or in some technical process, is able to reproduce bills that look almost exactly like those in general circulation. That is called counterfeiting. And it is very easy for the average person to understand that the cost of the paper and the ink and the machinery could be very little compared to the millions and millions and millions of dollars that that mind might be able to produce in a matter of a few hours of time. At the same time that we supposedly guard our society against these men who might produce money in that way, we also recognize 
that it is absolutely essential for society, civilized society, to have money. Civilization as we know it could not exist without an adequate and in fact an abundant supply of money. Modern society would have to forego and give up and not produce many of the important things which it has if there were not an adequate supply of money to take care of the exchanges of goods and services. Our farms would actually become self-sustaining units producing very little surplus for other people to buy if there were no money for them to sell their product and in exchange to buy other commodities from other people. If all of the money in America were suddenly to disappear and no new money could be placed in circulation, within a very short time, unemployment in the nation would lead to starvation and mobs of hungry people would probably plunder and kill in order to remain alive. Civilization as we know it would suddenly disappear, we would return to what was known as the Dark Ages, and all government except family, or that of very small groups, would cease to function. Does that sound rather illogical in this day and age? Well, brother, sister, stop and think for a moment of the consequences on the United States of America if somehow or other someone could control the supply of money to the extent that they could practically eliminate it from our society. What would you do next Friday when your employer had to tell you, well, I'm sorry, I know you've worked for me all week, and I know we've had these products produced, but we simply do not have the money to pay you. Now, most of you go on your lives month after month, year after year, never considering the possibility for good or evil, for anyone or any few number of people or any organization to control the supply, the amount of money in a nation. My older listeners would remember the Depression of the 1930s. I lived during that time. Those of you who are old enough to remember it will recall that the United States of America by 1930 had the most extensive and efficient transportation system in the entire world. Our nation had railroads and a road network and a water transportation system that was the envy of the world. Our farmers produced more per acre and more per man than any other nation in the world. Our communication system between the various states and localities was the best in the world. We had telephone, teletype, radio, and a well-operated government mail system. No war had ravaged American cities or countryside, countryside for more than 60 years. The Civil War had been over for about 70, and it had been confined primarily to the several southern states. No pestilence or famine had weakened our population or ravaged the land. And yet the United States of America suffered a depression such as it had never known in all of its history before. What had happened? Nothing more nor less than a reduction in the amount of money available to the people. I can remember the depression as a child when my father would give my brother and sister and I a nickel to spend on the 4th of July. Fifteen cents was all he could provide his children to spend on the nation's holiday. We had a hired man on our farm who worked for $15 a month and his board and room. He could not afford to get married because he couldn't spend the $2 for the wedding license. Well, now this sounds silly to some of you younger people, but stop and think with me for a moment. The only reason, the only cause of the Depression in the 1930s was a lack of money. And I defy anyone to tell me that we lacked other materials, produce, or workers. Twenty-five percent of the workforce in America was laid off. Farmers and small businessmen lost their homes to the bankers by the tens of thousands in a matter of a few years multiplied scores of millions of dollars of the real estate of the nation 
passed into the hands of those who created the money in the first place. And most Americans to this day do not understand what happened to them. In my book, Coming Soon, America Without Debt, Crime, or War, of course I go into this in much more greater detail than I could on this radio broadcast. But most of the older people would recognize that the United States of America, a great Christian nation spotted with tens of thousands of churches in most cities in the land, you cannot get out of sight for a matter of a few minutes when driving across the city of the steeple or the cross on a church. And yet how many ministers have you ever heard read the story in Nehemiah 5 or compare the situation in America to God's Israel people or to God's laws, statutes, and judgments? Our people, our workers, our businessmen, in fact, many of the wealthy people in the nation are actually totally ignorant of the causes and the reasons for depressions, prosperity, and war. And yet it is one thing, money, money. And as Paul wrote to Timothy, the love of money is the root of all evil. And yet our people are ignorant of the one thing that can cause the destruction of America more easily and more quickly than any other commodity in the nation. And that thing is money. This is Pastor Sheldon Emery, and we're going to continue with this tomorrow, Lord willing. And as we go along and consider the history of the United States of America, we're going to read God's Word so you can see that God Almighty knows what is happening upon this earth. In fact, in the 20th chapter of Job, you might want to read that. He talks of the punishment of the wicked for about 10 or 15 verses, and one of the things that he accuses the wicked of doing, he hath oppressed and hath forsaken the poor, because he hath violently taken away an house which he builded not. Yes, wicked people foreclose on homes that they did not build, and the American people do not know how it happens. Tomorrow, Lord willing, we're going to continue. And you have your Bible ready, and you sit with me and read God's Word about the greatest problem that America faces inside the nation. Until tomorrow, goodbye, God bless you, and Christian America. In the 22nd chapter of Proverbs, I read, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Yes, the wisdom of God tells us that those people who are in debt to other people are actually the servants of the people to whom they owe the debt. Here in the United States of America, the vast majority of our workers, the people who actually produce the wealth of the nation, are in debt to the moneylenders. Some of them a few thousand dollars, some of them actually tens of thousands of dollars when you consider the mortgages on their homes, automobiles, and personal property. We saw yesterday that in discussing and looking back upon the history of the United States of America 40 years ago at the beginning of the so-called Great Depression, that the United States of America as a nation was short of only one thing, and that one thing was money. And the reason it was short was very simple. The bankers of the United States, the men who control the money supply, the men who loan us the necessary money which we must have to purchase goods and services sim simply stopped making most of the loans that they ordinarily would have made. The people were forced to continue making payments on loans which they had already contracted for during the preceding years, but no new money was being put in circulation with new loans. Within a matter of a few months, Americans were being laid off by the thousands and thousands and thousands because their employers simply did not have the money to pay their wages. Within a matter of two years after the so-called collapse of the stock market, 25% of the working people in America were without jobs. And this thing was caused by one thing. Bankers withheld money from the people and almost destroyed the nation. Tens of thousands of homes, farms, and businesses were foreclosed upon and title was taken into the hands of the moneylenders. 
This depression lasted, as most of you older people know, until the war began in Europe, until 1939, when Europe went to war and America began to produce goods for the warring nations of Europe. At that time, our nation and the other nations of the world began to pour money into America, and almost as if by the waving of a wand, the depression was over. What had happened? A new supply of money had been put into circulation in America, and America was no longer in the depression. Hundreds of thousands of American people who have been educated in the colleges and universities of America do not understand the simple truth of the Great Depression that you have heard in the last two minutes, and most of them should hear it from one place, the supposed source of wisdom, the ministers who have God's Word and can read the truth of the Bible. But instead they talk about everything but the one thing that has almost destroyed America, the debts upon the American people. As we saw, it was destroying our forefathers under Nehemiah when we read Nehemiah 5. This, of course, has a beginning, and I mentioned yesterday that the United States of America has not issued constitutional and lawful money for a hundred years, but actually the total control goes back only to 1913. Even that, of course, is 60 years ago. In 1913, in December... The Congress of the United States, the governing body that was given the authority by the Constitution to coin money and regulate the value thereof, passed what has been known as the Federal Reserve Act. At that time, they set up a Federal Reserve Corporation, divided the United States into 12 districts, and gave total authority over the supply of the money in the nation to what is called a Federal Reserve Board. Now, most people do not know and still do not know today that the Federal Reserve Corporation is a private business owned by the member banks. It is no more federal than the Federal Tire Company. The name Federal, of course, was placed upon it apparently to deceive the people into thinking that the Federal Reserve Corporation somehow was controlled by the United States government. It is not. It is a private corporation and its decisions are made separately and often in opposition to the wishes of the president or the people. Since that day of infamy in 1913, which actually has been more disastrous to America than Pearl Harbor, a small number of people, probably less than 100,000 in total, have accrued to themselves all of the profits of printing our money and more. Since 1913, they have created, with little cost to themselves, tens of billions of dollars in money and credit, which then, as their own personal property, they loan to our government, to our states, to our school boards, and to us individually. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer had become the secret policy of the United States federal government. As an illustration for those who do not quite understand this, let me demonstrate how money goes in circulation in America. And if you can understand this simple dem demonstration, you will understand why the American people are in debt in the same manner that Nehemiah recounted in the fifth chapter of Nehemiah. For purposes of our illustration, let us assume that the federal government of the United States spends this year $1 billion more than it has taken in in taxes or other revenue. That means that it has $1 billion in bills to pay, but it does not have the money because it didn't take in quite enough to pay it. In order to obtain the $1 billion, the federal government goes to the Federal Reserve Board which is a private corporation, and borrows $1 billion. The exchange is made in the following manner. The Treasury Department, upon an authorization of the United States Congress to raise the debt limit, prints $1 billion in government bonds or treasury bonds. 
That $1 billion in bonds is then delivered to the Federal Reserve bankers in return for a credit of $1 billion on the books of the Federal Reserve banks. Yes, that is all that is done. And at the conclusion of that transaction, the government then writes $1 billion worth of checks, not money, but checks, and the bills are paid, but the American people have become indebted to the Federal Reserve banks for $1 billion plus interest for until that $1 billion in pay is paid. The total cost to the Federal Reserve banks is about $500, or the cost of the labor and the printing and the paper necessary for the bonds for which they are charged. And yet during the first year, they will get back to themselves $60 million in interest which will continue every year until the original $1 billion is paid. This transaction and hundreds of similar criminal transactions have taken place every year since 1913, so that now, a little more than 60 years later, the people of this nation are indebted to the banking families of America to the tune of more than $400 billion. Yes, $400 billion on which we pay the bankers every year almost two billions of dollars in interest. And that does not take into consideration the total state debts, municipal debts, school district, and personal debts which are created by the same type of transaction. No money needs change hands in these transactions. All this is, is what the bankers call checkbook money. The one billion dollars is created by the entry in the book. In 1910, and I have some statistics here and you listen to these. In 1910, the total federal debt was one billion one hundred and forty seven million dollars or about $12.40 per citizen. By 1920, after only six years of Federal Reserve shenanigans, the national debt had jumped to more than $24 billion, or $228.23 per person. By 1968, the national debt reached $347 billion, or $1,717 per citizen. By 1971, when this radio broadcast is made, Congress is considering raising the national, de national debt to somewhere in the neighborhood of $480 billion, which means over $2,000 per citizen of the United, in the United States in debt to the Federal Reserve bankers, and the Federal Reserve banks are owned by perhaps less than 10,000 people. Just think a moment. Those banks are probably owned by less than 10,000 people, yet the other 200 million people in America own, owe those bankers over 400 billions of dollars. Add to that, of course, the individual and personal debt, and we find that our people are in debt to the moneylenders to the tune of over $2,000 billion, or $2 trillion. Now, something is wrong with a system where the people who work and produce must find themselves where their wives must go to work and produce, and yet they go further and further in debt every year, every month, and literally every day. Now, these bankers, as I have explained, have obtained these debts through nothing more than bookkeeping entries and the issuance of what is called checkbook money. The only money in circulation in America today is money that has gone into circulation as a debt against some individual who has pledged real wealth his own collateral, his own possessions, or something he is purchasing in place of payment of that debt. If he cannot make the payment plus the interest, the lender takes the real property, which is often worth many times what the debt was. This is Pastor Sheldon Emery, and my time is up again. 
Tomorrow, Lord willing, we're going to go a little further on this, and I hope and I pray that you people who have wondered what is happening to this great and powerful Christian nation will realize that we have been placed in debt bondage just as old Israel was under Nehemiah. And there's a reason for it. Its effect is very simple. It will destroy the United States of America if allowed to continue. It is impossible that our people can continue on generation after generation with this staggering debt taking a larger and larger portion of their earnings. Our fathers worked about one-third of one day to pay taxes and interest. Our people today work more than one and one-half days of each week to pay taxes and interest. And our children very possibly will find themselves required to work between two and three days every week just to pay tribute to the money lenders. And did God know anything about it? Yes, he did. Tomorrow, Lord willing, we're going to turn to the Bible. Until then, you write, ask for my book, Coming Soon, America Without Debt, Crime, or War, because the book shows from the Bible how America is going to get out from under the crushing debt to the moneylenders. Until tomorrow, this is Pastor Emery saying goodbye. God bless you and Christian America.